Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here on my uh, second full day in Latvia. Uh, despite the rain, I got a chance. Uh, uh, Alexandra took me around the town and got to view the old part uh, of the city and uh, got to walk out in the rain, and it was, uh, it was fantastic. So now I know that I have to come back. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, I've had experience in the private sector and, and government. I worked on the White House staff under President Bush, helped to draft the U.S. national strategy to secure cyberspace, and I was later the lead U.S. government official for cybersecurity in the nation, uh, and then worked for a defense contractor, and now I've been working for Huawei, which some of you may have heard of us. We're a small Chinese company. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the criticality of understanding and addressing cyber and privacy risk, including from third parties. I think we may be a little too easy on our government officials, a little too easy on the heads of our private companies, uh, but we can talk about that despite the fact that this is, uh, this is being recorded and, uh, and streamed. Talk about the criticality of in individual organizations sharing information and working together both with government and the private sector and the critical role that the private sector has to continue to play in identifying standards and best practices and, and what the requirements are. One of the things that's missing, at least in the United States, is the buyers of ICT, information and communication technologies, are not using their purchasing power, are not working together with like-minded buyers. There's too much of a thought about, are we going to regulate or not? And when there's regulation, there's often not enough input from the private sector. But we can use our purchasing power to set informed security requirements that make sense. And we can hold our providers of supplier and services liable if they violate the terms of our procurements, if they violate the terms of our contracts. Too often in the breaches we see around the world, and certainly in the United States, it's third party providers, the breaches that get into the government uh, or the private companies. We also have to continuously improve. We have to learn, we have to recognize that we're not perfect, that security is a journey and not a destination. I think you all are quite aware, and a number of the issues already talked about today, as, as we move to, uh, to realize a new world, we, we move to a greater understanding of, of the benefits of ICT and what, what Internet of Things is really going to mean. It's not just billions of devices. It's the use of sensors, the use of big data, the use of artificial intelligence to help our lives, to help our organizations, uh, help the services and, and, and benefits that, that we enjoy. You all are aware, probably even more than I am, of, of a number of the threats and concerns, continuously evolving threats and concerns. Uh, those kinds of things that present challenges and present opportunities. As we adapt as defenders, as we try to make sure that we have the technologies and processes necessary, uh, and, and try to recognize the entire range of, of risk, Supply chain, we're trying to protect the confidentiality, integrity, availability, traceability, and authenticity of information across the, the upstream and downstream of products. Not enough companies, not enough governments are actually doing something about supply chain risk. One of the things I find, and, and uh, I had the opportunity a couple weeks ago to be in Georgia, uh, and I'm in a number of countries around the world talking, and certainly in the United States, we talk a good game of addressing supply chain risk. We do not do enough to address supply chain risk. And I recognize that organizations have different ranges of sophistication. And sometimes we need to use a crawl, walk, run approach. But supply chain risk is not extra. It's not something that we worry about later. It's fundamental to the risk posture of our organizations, of our critical infrastructure of the services that are provided within our nations. Malware, unauthorized parts, unauthorized configuration, scrap, substandard parts, unauthorized production, intentional damage. The risk of tainted, intentionally tainted malware where malicious code is inserted, intentional vulnerabilities are inserted, or there are counterfeit products. We have to make sure that in our procurements, in our requirements for our organizations, in our requirements for our critical infrastructure, and our requirements for our government services. It needs to be a public-private partnership to include the importance of supply chain and third-party risk. So cyber risk management, and it's called by different terms in different parts of the world. One of the popular ones in the United States, when, and where I read, led the cyber efforts from the, our US Department of Homeland Security, threats, vulnerabilities, and consequences. 
we have a tendency in my country to learn lessons over and over again. I don't know if anybody here is a golfer. Anybody here play golf? Okay, there is a lesson that we learn over and over in golf. It's when you're putting on the green, the short shots. Never up, never in. It means if you don't hit it far enough, it can't possibly go in the hole. And so we're putting and we end up coming up short and we learn that lesson over and over. But the real lessons in life, some of the lessons that we were supposed to learn from our terrorist attacks of 2001, we were supposed to learn from some of the major hurricanes we've suffered, is that we can't wait until we know of a specific threat. We have to take a risk-based approach to understand the threats, the vulnerabilities, and the consequences so we can prioritize our actions. The responsibility of leaders, as I said, I think we're too easy on our government leaders. We're too easy on the leaders of our private organizations. We're forgiving of the fact that they're not cybersecurity experts, but that's not their job. They need to know, they are responsible, and we have to hold them responsible to know what the organization needs to worry about and what the organization needs to do about it. And there can be experts who can help inform, and I'll talk some about some of the tools that help, can help inform that process. But they have to be committed to security and privacy, whether it's government or the private sector. And when it's government, it's got to not just be government in charge and government does everything and government withholds all the information. Government has to be an active collaborator and step back for the private sector sometimes to lead on the identification of what's most important. So just as a nation, just as an enterprise needs to use a risk management approach, we have to understand the risk environment, the business or government objectives. What are the critical functions and critical assets? And what needs to be done to protect those that are most critical? Because we cannot protect everything. We have to prioritize. And the bosses need to understand and be a part of this process and have visibility into it. So assessing risk and prioritizing risk management. There's a good tool, and I'll recommend a better one. There's a good tool for nations, International Telecommunications Union, under the uh, United Nations, the Global Cyber Index. The standards body in the United States, which is NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which really collaborates very extensively with the private sector and encourages input from around the world. The, uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework is an excellent tool for any organization. It's the kind of tool that the leaders of any organization, government or private sector, needs to make sure the participants in the organization have done so that that way the organization knows what they need to worry about and what they need to do about it. So government leaders need to have a risk management approach. I was asked a question in an interview yesterday about, uh, about secrecy of government and uh, you know, whether the private sector needs to know what the government's doing. Certainly there, there are government functions that, that we can't know about. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to, to have access to that information uh, some years back. But the idea that there has to be a collective view of what our nations need to perform the functions that we need to perform, government, critical infrastructure, individual organizations. What's the capacity and preparedness that's necessary? The government needs to know this, informed by particularly the leaders of the owners and operators of the critical infrastructure. What is necessary? And that collaboration and information sharing is absolutely critical. Vulnerabilities, uh, Mr. Leverett talked about responsible disclosure uh, earlier this morning. Collaboration and information sharing on the risk, on the emerging threats. And remember third party risk. I had a discussion with a, a leader of, uh, with our National Defense University who's in charge of education and he was saying that many of the leaders are beginning to get a handle on the fact that the organization needs to know what their risk is. But when they start talking about third-party risk or supply chain risk, oh, that's too much. They, they, it, it's too much to grasp. Well, it's not too much to grasp. That's part of the fundamental responsibility of leaders informed by the experts to address that risk. So the GCI, the Global Cyber Index under the ITU, measuring the development and status of a nation, legal measures, technical measures, organizational capacity, capacity building and cooperation. The ITU has worked hard with organizations around the world, including some of our government agencies, to help build cybersecurity capacity in countries around the world. I put in the link, and, and we'll be sh sharing the uh, slide deck through the conference, the Latvia Wellness Profile. 
Latvia has participated in populating the information, and that is a good first step. However, the tool that nations need to use is the Cyber Readiness Index 2.2 a tool developed by the Potomac Institute. I know they're working closely with the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise and the ITU and the EU, trying to come up with a measure that a nation can look at, government and private sector, of how prepared is the country. Not just can you say you have a national strategy, do you have a cert, do you have information sharing, but what is the quality of that? What is the quality of the capability relative to cybercrime? This index gives a nation the ability to tell what their status is relative to other nations. And I've provided a link here. So far, only nine nations of the world have, have commissioned the analysis, the independent analysis of the preparedness of that nation. Just like an organization, a nation needs to know their preparedness. So the stakeholders, the leaders, the executives, the legislative branches, and the key interest groups have an idea of where the nation stands and where the nation needs to go. So the ITU has additional resources that may, perhaps many of you are aware of. The Honeypot Research Network, a sensor network feeding real-time intelligence to countries. We have to make sure that countries and organizations take advantage of these real-time information sharing. I'm sure the CERT is already uh, active in this. The Abuse Watch Alerting and Reporting Engine to assess, help the computer response teams enhance incident response functions. That's part of the information. That's receiving it, but we also have to make sure we're sharing it across government and with the private sector. The ITU also makes available uh, some reports that are uh, provided by Symantec and Trend Micro, and I've provided the link that organizations can get access to that threat information. So the East-West Institute has written a paper, and I provided a link to it, to help the buyers of ICT start the conversation with their supplier so that you can start addressing your supply chain risk. Start having, and again, it can be a crawl, walk, run approach, that the kinds of questions you need to ask, what you need to consider uh, requ requiring from or giving preference to your providers. And that publication includes in the appendix 11 categories of 100 questions that an organization might ask. Uh, Huawei prepared those questions. Uh, we've been working with Microsoft uh, and the Open Group and the East-West Institute to prepare this effort so we can start using the purchasing power of ICT to start getting the providers of suppliers and services to raise the bar. We do business in over 170 countries, and frankly, not enough of our buyers are asking us the tough questions. We want to encourage the buyers around the world to ask the tough questions of everyone because we have global supply chain risk. The, the, the buyer security guide has two major sections, enterprise security governance and the product and service life cycle. Uh, Mr. Lever talked about the life cycle issue earlier, from design through sustainment and response all the way to end of life. So private organizations. Private organizations need to have the commitment to cybersecurity and privacy at the highest levels. They need a strategy to address future challenges. Fundamental, and I almost never hear this in, in cybersecurity conferences in the United States. There's talk about, well, the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer, or the CSO, needs to have time with the board. You need to have access. The organization needs an enterprise-wide governance capability so that there is visibility across the board of the risk. Each of the different elements has to have their particular sets of requirements informed by statutes or directives, inf in informed by customer requirements or best practices, and internal company requirements. And there needs to be oversight and accountability. In, in my country, the word compliance is considered a dirty word in cybersecurity because people say, oh, we don't want compliance. We don't want to check the box. It's got to be based on risk. Yes, it's got to be based on risk, but an organization needs to know, and the managers and executives and the individual uh, folks, employees need to know what are the requirements, what do we have to do. There needs to be separation of duties and there needs to be independent checks to make sure you're doing it. And so we need that overall visibility across the organization. HR, service delivery, legal, et cetera, across the board have to have their particular sets of requirements and the board of directors in the C-level need, need to have visibility into how the organization is doing for their risk. Within those, you need consistent, repeatable processes that hopefully are auditable so you can make sure that folks are doing what they need to do. Robust verification. I don't like it when somebody comes to audit me. 
I don't like it, frankly, when we have to respond to requests uh, from buyers to have to answer 100 security questions, even like the questions that, that we've suggested others ask us. I don't like it, but I know it's right. And I know that's what you need to make sure that you are doing the right thing. And we learn lessons from that so we continuously improve, so it's not a static process. Openness and transparency regarding progress, successes, and failures. So the tool for private organizations, the NIST cybersecurity framework, it's been mischaracterized as a standard. It is a risk analytic tool that any organization can use. And if you're not using this, you've got to use something, frankly. It's a set of standards, methodologies. It aligns policy, business, and technological approaches. Prioritize flexible, repeatable information security measures and controls, identifies areas for improvement, and you want to be consistent with voluntary international standards. It has three parts. It has a framework. This is the key thing that tells you, it helps you as an organization determine where are we, what are we doing, what do we need to do. It doesn't tell you what you need to do. It gives you ideas of international references of standards and best practices that you can do for certain functions. The profile tells the risk status. So an organization, and I think this is a fundamental responsibility of the leaders of organizations, you need to know the risk status of your organization. And you need to know what your target risk status is. This is called a profile here. And you need to have a path to get there. You don't need to be a cybersecurity expert to do those things. And I believe it's irresponsible for the leaders of government or private organizations to not know what their risk status is, to not know where they want to go, and to not have a path to get there, and to not have internal accountability. So the first part's the framework that I talked about. So just like any organization would do, the key, and, and I think Mr. Leverett mentioned at least some of these, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. It helps you use a tool to say, where do we as an organization stand relative to these functions? For each one, what are the processes and assets? What are the safeguards? What are the techniques, et cetera? You go through that process. So one of the lead agencies in the United States asked me to work with one of our tier three providers, wireless providers to go through with their experts and sit down and use this tool so that they could say, where do we stand? What are we doing? What do we have to do? Where are we now? Where do we want to go? That process is an excellent process, and I think the leaders of government and private sector should set in motion making sure that you guys have done that kind of an analysis. So under each of the functions, you remember the five functions, identify, protect, there's a category. So asset management, business environment, governance. So you make sure you're using this analysis to say, well, what are we doing on asset management? What are we doing on, on business environment? So you have these categories, and then for each of the five, and then under each category, you have subcategories. So the category is business environment. It gives you a subcategory of the different kinds of things that you need to consider. And then it gives you informative references. It gives you some of the most important international standards. It's not saying you should do these. It's not saying they should apply to you. There may be particular industry standards that you want to use. But it's a tool, and you can use yours about what you're doing. And I would also strongly recommend one of the lessons from financial sector. Throughout the world, it's recognized that we need independent financial audits of the books of major organizations. Why is that? It's human nature. We don't just trust people to do the right thing, even when they're good people. And in ICT around the world, we can't just trust the organizations that we buy from or we partner with, even if they got great, great reputations, because tomorrow it could change with the insider threats. We have to trust but verify. It has to be a continuous process of verification of all the stuff they're interacting with. The profile, what is the risk posture of the organization? The implementation tier, where do we stand as an organization? And unless you're in the top two tiers, you might as well forget it because you're so vulnerable that, you know, why are you even proceeding? If you're really vulnerable, then you need to make sure you're looking at what are your most important assets, what are your critical functions, and what do we need to do to protect them, to minimize the risk, can't eliminate the risk, to minimize the risk to those key functions. So a coalition of industry groups that was encouraged by government in the United States, the Open Group Trusted Technology Forum that includes representatives of the Department of Defense, major companies like Microsoft, IBM, Cisco, came together a number of years ago to create a supply chain standard of processes for technology and supply chain. I was fortunate enough to be reelected the vice chair of this group. IBM is the, uh, is, is the chair of it. And so this group set in motion creating a standard that was recognized by ISO, the International Standards Organization, 20243, covering the processes of technology development supply chain. If you have a higher risk situation, you may want to do, it, you may want to do testing. 
you may want to do a requirement such as the type that I asked Mr. Leverett about, where you require your providers to make sure they're notifying you of vulnerabilities of the higher risk, such as the CVSS uh, 7 or above. That's the most critical vulnerabilities. You can use this standard to identify the questions you might ask of or require from your providers regarding design and sourcing and building and fulfillment across technology development and supply chain. So we are around the world. Uh, we believe that it's a global problem and we have to work together on it, that no individual organization has the answers and we have to continuously collaborate and share information. We have cybersecurity experts around the world that we're, we're working with uh, in our carrier business, enterprise, and mobile devices. We are partnered in, in our processes, our product security architecture, our security capabilities, horizontal solutions, IoT, 5G, all those things. That, that's what the major companies of the world are doing, are partnering with others, and I hope government will follow that example. So the key elements of a security assurance system, and we have a, a paper that tells the details of, of our particular approach, but we need end-to-end -end with a global security governance, and we have a global committee that the heads of all our business groups, IT, legal, et cetera, and then in the United States, I have a similar committee where everybody from those groups serves on the committee to make sure we're holding ourselves accountable. We have the elements of the end-to-end -end assurance, uh, and we've listed those factors there, uh, but end-to-end -end product delivery from concept to plan to development to launch the life cycle, you want to have a conversation with your providers, your major providers. Are they doing these things and what are the related security activities that are involved, including the kinds of code review and, and vulnerability testing that we talked about. We assess our suppliers from quality and, uh, and, and functionality as well as cybersecurity looking for efficiency, security, and resilience. We establish baselines. We talked about the key parts of an organization. For products, you have baselines. For everything, you have baselines. You need to make sure you know what you have to do and whether or not you're meeting it. Physical security, software delivery security, organization and processes. We have over 100 baselines in, in 10 security elements based on laws, infrastructure, security assets. You also need to compartmentalize based on risk to protect the users using such as hierarchical key architecture, protect your networks, multi-level and isolated domain. And we need to increasingly use big data to help identify the anomalous activity within our networks, that which is trying to penetrate and that which is trying to exfiltrate information from our networks. Enterprise risk management, we've got to collaborate and share information. We have to consider third-party risk, it's not optional. And buyers need to use their collective security power. And I suggest you consider the open trusted technology provider standard, whether you want to require providers to be certified or whether you want to use the elements in setting your own requirements uh, for your purchasing. We have a minute or two of questions. I guess you have to use a microphone, unfortunately. Yes, we have to use microphone uh, as uh, because we need our uh, viewers to see the questions in the presentation as well. Okay, uh, so a question here is, uh, in, in Huawei's case, how far in this supply chain, how far do you see them? Do you see your suppliers, 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 do you see beyond that? Yeah, and that's part of the challenge as the NIST cybersecurity framework is trying to explicitly incorporate supply chain risk. So we have thousands of suppliers. So we have to qualify all of our suppliers for all the different functions, the eight functions I listed, including cybersecurity. So we have to evaluate their products, their security. Those who are a little marginal, we put on a, well, some we reject, but we put on a remediation plan of one to three years to try to move the processes in place but you have to make sure that all your suppliers are evaluated. And that's one of the challenges of buyers. Buyers need to push it down, like say the major communication carriers. When they buy things, they need to make sure that the major providers or the integrators have evaluated or somebody has evaluated the, the, the supply chains and the technology development and, and supply chain risk of everybody. And you need spot checking throughout your supply chain. One of the beauties is we have some external testing labs and folks are held accountable throughout the process and so if you find a problem, we have a lab before they leave the company and labs outside, 
Then it goes back. You have to trace all your components because, as you know, we use a lot of open source. So we have to make sure we supply the patches even for open source products that are contained in our code. And so it had to go back to fix it. And people are held accountable if the fix isn't made, if, if somebody finds it later and goes back. So that encourages building in security and software evaluation. But it really has to be throughout the entire supply chain. Or if it's smaller providers, you need to make sure that you're addressing the risk in some other way. Hello, Cor from Estonia. So I have a question about supply chain security in consumer products uh, versus the business to business uh, products. So if there is an issue, security issue in the end user product, if a mobile phone catches fire, then it is known and it is addressed and the security society and all the society will know and take this into account. But if there's a vulnerability somewhere deeper in the supply chain, let's say that you are building ATMs and some of the basic components is having a security issue, then it often gets hidden in the NDAs, contracts, whatnot, so that actually the community, security industry, doesn't know what happens on the undercurrents of the supply chains. Do you think it is a problem? And if yes, is there a way to mitigate? Yeah, it, it's definitely a problem, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very complicated issue. I mean, one of the things that we use, some of the products that, that Mr. Leverett talked about, to make sure that we've looked for the vulnerabilities that have been reported in the, in the international or national databases of, of vulnerabilities, and we make sure they get fixed and, and that the, uh, the, the patches are applied for the, the, the most critical vulnerabilities. Uh, there's some work in the standards bodies to, to try to figure out what additional standards can be required. Uh, we have some, there's some major liability issues that Mr. Leverett touched on in terms of, you know, some places say there's no liability for, for the software. So that's part of the challenge of, of, of trying to make sure uh, that we address the vulnerabilities in a, a demonstrable way. Consumers, it's even harder because it's not just the big buyers, because big buyers of technology can use their purchasing power to have an impact. But what does the individual consumer do? And that's why I think the regulators play a major, major part. That's why the industry groups and, and best practices, Underwriters Laboratory, for example, that has a lot of traction in Europe, has, is, has begun to create standards to actually evaluate the products. The International Standards Organization, 3GPP, is doing some work on the IoT security authentication so that you can have the security credentials uh, secure even though you're going across the viral slices of, of cyberspace, driverless cars, remote surgery. People want to be able to access those virus, viral slices quickly, but you want to make sure your authentication requirements uh, are not stolen. And so the 3GPP effort is trying to create standards to help protect that. So you've highlighted a, a great problem. I don't have time to go into it in any more detail, but it's definitely a very real concern.